Today we will try to turn this concept ID into this world's first atmosphere powered battery. I'll show how it's built, we'll look at the fundamentals that makes this thing possible and of course we will test this prototype against the efficiency of conventional batteries. Could this be the future of energy storage or was this project just a waste of time? This video is sponsored by PCBWay. By improving the efficiency of energy storage, we can reduce dependency on fossil fuels and accelerate the implementation of green energy. That's why the search for new, innovative and efficient ways to store energy has accelerated worldwide. And this has led to some groundbreaking developments. One of those comes from the startup Gravitricity, which came up with the simple yet brilliant idea of storing energy using gravity. Their idea is to equip abandoned mine shafts with a heavy weight attached to a winch. When there's an excess of energy, the weight can be lifted. And when the demand for energy is high, the stored energy can be released by letting the weight drop and use the motor of the winch as a generator. After seeing this, I wondered if it would be possible to bring this idea closer to home without the need of these deep holes in the ground. Unfortunately, it didn't take long before I found out that even a scale down system would require a significant amount of weight. But that's where the magic of vacuum comes in. Using the atmospheric pressure on the vacuum, I was able to design a system that's both compact and powerful. One of the easiest ways to experience the strength of the atmosphere is by using a syringe. When you push out all the air and seal off the end, we can pull the piston back and create a vacuum, essentially fighting the atmospheric pressure. Because it's a given that the atmospheric pressure exerts a force of around 1 kg per square centimeter, we are able to calculate exactly with how much force the piston is being pushed back in. For example, the plunger of this little syringe has a diameter of 15.6 mm. So if we do the math, this piston has a surface area of 1.91 square centimeters. That means that with a vacuum inside, this piston should be theoretically pushed back in with a force of around 1910 grams. To test how well this theory matches reality, I've set up a small test rig. The length of the arm from the pivot point to the center of the syringe is exactly the same distance as from the pivot point to where the other arm presses on the scale. So now, if I pull back the piston, the scale should show something close to the calculated value of 1910 grams. And even though I thought it probably wasn't the most precise way to measure this, we can see it's almost spot on. I based the vacuum tubes of this prototype on the dimensions of this large syringe. Mainly because its seal has already proven itself to be effective, but also because the all around sealing is perfect in combination with the non airtight 3D printed parts we'll be using. The syringe has an internal diameter of 36 mm, so ideally I need tube of that same size. And luckily I didn't have to search long, because it turns out that the common diameter for plexiglass tubes is 40 mm with a wall thickness of 2, so exactly what I needed. The tube was delivered in two lengths of 1 meter, which I cut into 8 equal pieces. Because you know, the more cylinders, the more piston area we'll have, the more force we can convert into energy. Of course I wanted to know if the seals from the syringe would also work with the plexiglass tube. And even though all dimensions of the 3D printed piston are exactly the same as the original syringe, the seal would pop off. Most likely because it's not really designed for being used to create a vacuum, I guess. The solution however was quite simple luckily. Because I designed the piston as two parts, I could add these 3D printed rings in between, which bites into the seal when the two parts are screwed together, and so keeping it in place. For charging the battery, we need motors that are able to pull back all 8 pistons at the same time. For that, I picked two of these 12V DC motors with a 600 to 1 gear reduction. These should be more than strong enough to pull back all 8 plungers simultaneously. And the great thing is, due to the high gear reduction, we can also use them as the generators to generate electricity while discharging the battery. So that's two birds with one stone. Now, if we want to optimize this design so every bit of available force from the vacuum pistons will be converted into electricity, we need to know how much torque is needed to drive these motors in reverse as generators. To find out, I've made a little test setup. On the output shaft of the motor, I've mounted the arm with a length of 150 mm. At the end of this arm hangs a bottle that I can slowly fill with water through a tube. 
As soon as the motor starts to turn, I stop filling and we can weigh the bottle to see exactly how much force is needed to get the motor to turn. And in this case, that's 754 grams. But if we want to be able to calculate exactly how much force we need, we also need to know the diameter of the pulley that will be on the motor shaft. To find out, we need to look at how we will transfer the force from the eight pistons to the motors. Each piston is attached to a piece of timing belt. The timing belt goes up, runs over these pulleys and ends up in the center where the belts of all eight pistons will be connected. But because the eight pistons combined will deliver over 80 kg of force, that connector has to be quite strong. At least stronger than the 3D printed version. Ideally, I need this thing made from steel or aluminum. Luckily, there's PCB way. Because did you know that in addition to producing PCBs, they can also help you with any injection molded, 3D printed, sheet metal or CNC machine parts you need for your project? And the great thing is, after uploading your file, you immediately have an indication of what it will cost. After ordering, production begins and your parts will be delivered in no time. And the quality they deliver is outstanding. Just look at the surface finish of this part. But more importantly, I'm sure this one is more than strong enough to handle the 80 kilograms of force. In the base, the motors will be connected to the same shaft. And if we somehow wrap the timing belt around the pulley on the shaft, we could use the force of the plungers to drive the generators or drive the motors to charge the battery. To minimize the chance of the belt slipping, I've added an extra pulley, causing the belt to make a 180 degree turn. This way, as many teeth of the belt are connected to the teeth on the pulley as possible. Because I thought it would be best to keep the belt tensioned as well, I added a gear to the main pulley and replaced the pulley we just added with a 3D printed one that also has a gear attached to it. This makes both pulleys rotate at the same speed. To complete this tensioning system, I added an arm with an idler wheel that presses the belt onto the pulley below using a spring. This will hopefully ensure the same amount of tension on the belt regardless of the direction of rotation of the motors. Now we know what pulley will be on the motor shaft, we can calculate exactly how much force is needed to ensure that the two generators will start rotating. From our earlier test, we know that a minimum of 754 grams of force is needed at 150 mm from the center of the shaft to drive one motor. We now know that our pulley has a diameter of 12 mm and thus the force will be applied at 6 mm from the center of the shaft. This means that according to the law of mechanical advantage, we can divide the two distances and multiply that by the weight needed to rotate the shaft at 150 mm, which means we need a minimum of around 19 kg per motor. Times that by 2, because we need to drive two motors, equals 38 kg of force to drive them both. And that's like half the force the vacuum tubes deliver, but that's perfect, because now we have two options. One, because we're only using half of the force of the vacuum pistons, we could double the amount of generators, which would double the power output. Or, we create a belt and pulley system to lower the output force of the pistons, so it closely matches the force needed to drive the generators, which more importantly, will at least double or can maybe even triple the stroke of the timing belt. To show you what I mean, I've made this, with on the left side a weight representing the pulling force of the vacuum pistons, and on the right side a weight which represents the force exerted on the pulley on the generator shaft. Now, if we directly connect the belt from the vacuum pistons to the pulley, as you would expect, the force exerted on the pulley is the same as the pulling force of the pistons. But if we change the configuration and add an extra pulley, we see that the force exerted on the generator shaft would be halved. And we also see that the length or stroke of the belt doubled which of course is positive for the final power output. With the hardware complete, the last thing we need to add before we can start testing are the electronics. And I won't bore you with the details, but the electronics basically consists of two separate circuits. One for charging our battery and one for discharging. To be able to switch between the charge and discharge circuit, I added these four relays and this switch. There's a 10 watt 5 ohm resistor that serves as our load during the discharge of the battery. And for measuring the voltage and current during charging and discharging, I've added this power monitor module, which is connected to the Arduino underneath. 
I also extended the USB port of the Arduino so we can easily plug in the laptop for live power monitoring during charging and discharging. With everything covered and after a little struggle putting everything together, we can finally test this thing. Let's see if everything works as expected. I really hope the 3D printed parts can handle those 80 kilograms of force. But there's only one way to find out, I guess. Start charging. To measure the efficiency of our vacuum battery, we'll need to compare the power needed to charge the battery to the total amount of power it will have generated after a full discharge. But before we do that, let's look at the efficiency of some other ways to store energy, like pumped hydro. Another popular way to store energy on a large scale, which has an efficiency between 70 and 85%. Next gravity energy storage, what this whole project is actually based on, which has an average efficiency of 80 to 90 percent. And finally, conventional lithium-ion batteries, which on average have an efficiency between 90 and 95 percent. And now, where do you think the vacuum-driven battery comes in this list? Before, after, or somewhere in between? Ready? To fully charge, our vacuum battery consumes 860 watts and the power output after a complete discharge is 628 watts. That means its efficiency is around 73%, which puts it between pumped hydro and gravity energy storage. So was this project worth all the time and effort? If you ask me, I'd say yes. Given the result, I think there may be some potential in this approach. But what's more important, what do you think? Do you think it's worth building and testing a larger version? Maybe you have ideas to improve this approach, or perhaps you think this has no chance at all. Let me know what you think in the comments below.